Okay. Hello and welcome everyone to Eric Anders uh, Licensiate uh, Seminar. My name is Mikael Nybak. I'm Associate Professor in Legal Dynamics and also Supervisor of uh, Eric, as well as Chair of this Licensiate Seminar today. Uh, so, uh, Swedish Licensiate uh, is a halfway uh, degree towards a uh, full PhD degree. A PhD student cannot uh, choose to take a Licensiate uh degree or not so eric has chosen to do that so he will do this uh, halfway uh, seminar you can say towards uh, full uh, phd it's normally done after uh, three years uh, and the full phd in sweden is five years normally first i would like to welcome klaus rydger from Linköping university he's an associate professor in traffic informa informatics Hope that's still correct. <laughs> uh, Klaus will be a opponent in today's uh, uh, Lassensit seminar and will discuss the Lassensit thesis uh, with Eric. I would also like to welcome Xiaoliang Ma, who is a senior researcher and docent in uh, Italian transport system at ATH. And uh, Xiaoliang Ma will be the examiner uh, of this Lassensit thesis. Um, so the process. Uh, of today is that Eric will present uh, 30 minutes uh, his license thesis and uh, after that uh, Klaus and Eric will start a discussion and it's uh, up to Klaus to discuss for as long as he would like in order to highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of uh, the thesis. Um, after that I will open up the floor uh, both for you here uh, as well as uh, on Zoom. Uh, to ask questions. Uh, so those of you who are in Zoom, you can just raise your hand or write in the chat and we will bring up those questions as well during that uh, session. Um, after this, we will close the online and uh, the public event of this Licensed Seminar. And uh, uh, the supervisors, the examiner and the opponent will go downstairs. Uh, into a meeting and discuss. And during that time, you can start uh, with the lunch and the mingle. And after that, we will come up and, and make the uh, decision. No, to everyone. Okay, so please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Erik Amlöv. I'm a PhD student here at KTH and at the Integrated Transport Research Lab, where I've conducted my research so far. And the title of my thesis is Exploring Societal Impacts of Self-Driving Public Transport Using Four-Step Transport Models. And I, I will talk about this for extended uh, time, especially what, it's, what actually is a four-step transport model as well, and how I have actually used it to investigate these impacts. Uh, before, but before I, I start, I will begin with a bit of a background as to why I actually do research this in general. So a few years back, I think it's about five years ago, I was um, I was working as a traffic analyst at the Stockholm Public Transport SL, and I. In my work there, I mainly used made like forecasts of the future use of public transport in Stockholm, and I was sort of like hit with the question like okay this self-driving technology that everyone is talking about will it affect public transport i was like yeah probably will how i have no idea and that's sort of the background as to why i actually wanted to study this to see like what are the impacts of this new technology on public transport usage so that's sort of the background as to why i actually started doing this a few years ago but I would like to start my presentation with uh, pressing the right place. Thanking uh, Mikael, my main supervisor, uh, my co-supervisors uh, Erik and Mia as well, and my previous uh, supervisor Anna Pernestål, uh, uh, who has continued on to Skåne since then. My manager Gabriella at SL as well. Uh, a lot of colleagues here, 
at uh, at ITRL. I think it's really like, a, even though I'm the one actually responsible for all this, this is really sort of a group work and has been worked with like a lot of discussions with coworkers who have really helped me to understand this topic more and more. And all of my like participants in general, co-workers, project partners in various projects that I work with, my family and friends as well. Some of you are here today. Um, and then reading Stockholm and Traffic Racket for funding a lot of my research as well. Uh, but in this presentation, I have, I have a few different topics that I will talk about. Uh, starting first of all with an introduction self-driving technology why are we why am i even looking at it why is it important um and then further going to what are my actual research questions that i've posed in this thesis so a bit more specific i will elaborate a bit on a four-step model what what is a four-step model uh, and especially the Sampers model, which is a Swedish transport model that I've been using extensively. Um, then talk a bit about self-driving technology in general. What are the implications of self-driving technology? What will it actually impact? And then the research process. So basically, how have I incorporated self-driving technology into the Sampers model? The key findings for that. I will briefly mention some limitations as well. Um, and then conclusions. What are my main conclusions from this work? So that's sort of an outline of this, this presentation. But I think we'll actually start with a short movie. And this is a movie from, I think that will look like this. Uh, so this is a movie which was posted about 10 years ago from Google, showcasing their self-driving car. So we see there, there are a lot of like Google logos here in the car and so on. And this is a car that's at least what it looks like in the movie is driving itself. The, the uh, sort of driver here sitting in the driver's seat isn't touching the, the, the wheel at all. There's someone else actually doing this. this. It's a, it's a machine driving itself. So this video was posted about 10 years ago and held a lot of promises on like, okay, this technology will soon be here. It's just a matter of time. We, we, we're just gonna perfect it a bit more and then release it to the public basically is what they were saying. Um, I think we'll stop there. <clears throat> so, and it's basically like, okay, so the first question was posted was like, okay, why are we even looking at this at all? And there's been some like early research into this looking at like, yeah, of all the crashes, and this was for the United States, but I think it's pretty similar for Sweden, 90% uh, of crashes are due to human errors. So with a machine, we will have no crashes due to this or like a 90% decrease in crashes for example. Uh, there have been, there's been promises to cut congestion by 50% or maybe even more by some researchers with these, these cars working a bit more together in a sense, like sort of connected to each other and maybe being able to drive a bit better, so to say, to avoid congestion as well. And that we could potentially also reduce the number of uh, vehicles that we have as well, if we were to share these cars as well, which sort of self-driving technology was seen as a, a uh, building block of having some sort of shared taxi service that anyone can use. And we don't really need to have these private cars that, you're, that are just standing around all day. So this was sort of the promises that were, uh, have been made. Um, but since, which I think all of you know, we don't really have self-driving cars today. We have some self-driving public transport, but only on a, like a demonstrator level. Uh, still, it's really early tests still. So we're not there yet, at least. And I think that some of these, these sort of promises, not necessarily made by researchers, but by the industry in large, 
have begun to be a bit more questioned as well, that this might not, not actually uh, not come into light as well. And previous research into this has been primarily focused on car usage. There hasn't really been all that much research into public transport uh, when it comes to this. Definitely some, but way not even close to the extent of the number of papers being published when it comes to uh, cars, so you think you use the word car. Um, the public transport research that has been done has also been treated as two different separate research streams. So there's been a lot of research into self-driving cars, a little research into self-driving public transport as well, but not really taken together as well to see the entire uh, transport system. Um, when it comes to these like simulation studies that I'm conducting, I only have identified two papers that have actually used this previously <coughs> by Bush and by Galau et al. Um, previously, so it's sort of not really been, been investigated all that much previously. And when it comes to self-driving cars, the main conclusions when it comes to simulation studies so far are that we will see increased car use, increased increase kilometers driven, which means more CO2 emissions and probably congestion as well, but maybe not. Uh, but that this is also largely dependent on assumptions as well, which I will actually come back to uh, later as well. But assumptions is really a lot of this research is contingent on which assumptions we actually have in this. So, <clears throat> in my thesis, I've posted the three questions. First of all, uh, which potentials self-driving technology could actually pose for public transport? In these four strap transport models, what do we need to adjust to simulate self-driving public transport? So that's the second question. And then the third question revolves like, okay, which would the implications be if we actually have self-driving technology? And what can we learn by using four-step uh, transport models? What conclusions can we draw them? So all of this talk about four-step transport models, and I haven't really explained them so far. Um, but basically, uh, the idea of these models is to understand sort of the entire transport system. You kind of want to get an overview of the entire, the, the entire transport system of Stockholm, for example. That's the idea of uh, transport models. They're basically big SimCity models of the entire, um, of an entire region, so on. Um, they're usually not used for the smaller, like covering a single street, for example, or even a single neighborhood could be as well, but usually they're quite big in scope. So covering a big region could be entirety of Europe, for example, uh, to kind of see like all transport movement done by a car in Europe, for example, could be a, a, a four-step transport model. And as the name implies, it has four steps where the first one uh, regards some sort of trip generation, which basically corresponds to how many trips will be made. So this kind of answers, well, do I want to make a trip or not, or several? Um, the second question is about where do I actually want to make this trip as well? So the first question is, uh, do I want to make a trip? The second question is where? The third one is, okay, by which mode? Should I walk? Should I use a car? Should I use cycling, for example? Um, and then how should I actually go about there? So say that I've actually chosen cycling, okay, which route will I actually take to my destination as well? But <clears throat> as you might understand that all of this is of course contingent on each other, so my ability to actually decide to make a trip is dependent on which routes are actually available to me. Uh, I can't really go, I, I can't really go by car if there aren't any roads, for example. So yeah, so all of these are sort of like work together. And this is a model that's 
um, that is uh, uh, usually run for several, um, what do you call it, several uh, instances so that you run it once and then you get some sort of non-equilibrium and then you run it again until you reach some sort of equilibrium in all of these parts. And there are a lot of uh, other factors that affect these models as well. We take in consideration demographic uh, asp aspects. So for example, uh, of the population living here, how many have uh, are between 10 and 19 years old, for example, how many are men, how many are female, could be other demographic factors as well. We look at car ownership or like economic status in general, uh, economic income. Um, also where people live, where workplaces are, where there might be grocery stores, for example, which affects where people actually move. Uh, and then the entire transport network in itself, which basically mostly feeds into it. Uh, so what are actually available? What is the fare of using public transport, for example? So all of these factors fact are, are uh, are used as input to all of these steps, basically, depending a bit on the model itself. And then you get some sort of output of this, and we usually have a look at, for example, travel time between the different destinations, could be vehicle kilometers traveled, for example, is usually sort of used maybe as a proxy for uh, pollution, for example. So if uh, kilometers travel go up, we can assume that pollution is probably going up as well. Um, could be mode shares, for example, which is something that uh, SL cares a lot about as well. Would Does public transport usage go up if you change the network, for example? So a lot of this, these things. So these are really big models in general. And I will go into some first a bit, which is then the uh, Swedish uh, national transport model, which is administrated by Trafikverket, the Swedish Transport Administration. Um, it's been in use since the early 2000s, uh, but I think that there have been predecessors earlier as well. Um, it's calibrated on two travel surveys uh, uh, from the 90s uh, and 98 to 2001, and it covers everyone above the age of six and above. Um, Yes, mostly Sweden, but we have a few neighboring counties as well. So maybe the greater uh, Copenhagen region, I think, is included as well. And some region in Norway, and I'm not sure about Finland, might be some areas as well, where we have a lot of people going across uh, into Sweden and a lot of Swedes traveling into the other countries as well. Some person the divides travel into seven different traveler purposes. So it could be commuting to work, going to school, visiting friends, for example, um, going to leisure activities. So going play sports or whatever it could be, uh, business travel as well. Uh, so different, different, seven different travel purposes. And it simulates four different time periods as well. So we have the morning peak where we have a lot of congestion. So this is Stockholm, for example. We have a lot of congestion here in Essingleda. We have the midday, which is a bit less congested at least. Afternoon peak, where people want to travel back south from the north. And then evening, when we have uh, way less traffic in Stockholm, so not a lot of congestion. Um, so this is the Sampers model. Yes, about self-driving technology then. Uh, basically like implications, what would it actually mean? What, what, what would self-driving technology actually imply for the transport system or for people in general? And I've divided this up into two different areas. First of all, is some sort of like human perception. So basically, if I were to go in a self-driving car, maybe I can use the time more productively. If I use some sort of self-driving um, uh, train, for example, would that affect my like productivity or my ability to do other stuff as well? Uh, I think a good um, example of this is, for example, riding by a train compared to riding to a bus, where I, at least I can actually see the work when when using a train, which is not really 
um, common when using bus because they they um, move a lot more to the sides and brake and accelerate and so on. Um, so it might affect some sort of productivity or what we call the value of time. Uh, but it also leads to some sort of like a lot of people may not feel safe using a self-driving um, vehicle. Um, actually, I think there's been a lot of, uh, I've read a few surveys that say about 50% of the population is really positive and the other 50% are really negative about this, um, this development as well. And this affects what we call the value of travel time, which is basically how much of how much does it like cost to use a option for example uh, which takes into consideration these things and a few other things as well could be waiting time for example so this is basically how we capture this sort of perception of, of uh, people using a mode uh, itself and it also affects vehicle behavior uh, accident rates, I talked about previously, we don't really know if these will decline with self-driving technology, but there's some sort of potential or um, vision of decreasing these at least. Uh, vehicle speed, road capacity, and some sort of flow on the highway as well, which is really affected by travel, by like uh, how people behave basically when I, when I drive, how, when will I, how close do I need to be to the other car to start braking, for example, and that really affects the entire flow of, of a highway uh, in itself. So this could have a lot, of, a lot of implications for road capacity, could go down as well, uh, depending on what we sort of assume that this would mean. Uh, energy assumption as well, uh, assuming that we use some more of echo driving, for example, uh, could be affected. The cost of the vehicle, of course, especially initially when this would mean a, a big cost to purchase a car with this sort of technology. But it could also mean that we have other types of services. I mentioned this like self-driving taxi in the start, for example, where this has been envisioned that this could lead to some sort of other services that I don't, actually don't own a car myself, but I all, always use the taxi, which is way uh, cheaper than the present one. Uh, could also lead to other types of public transport services as well, where we have these like smaller shuttles, which are usually, which are at the moment being used, I think, in both Shista and in Barkaby in Stockholm, uh, where, have, where there's been um, envisioned that these would use some sort of like on demand. So we actually don't have a fixed network, but drive where people actually want to go in real time instead of having a fixed, yeah, we always stop at these locations and we have this headway. Uh, between stops for uh, b between um, uh, until the next bus, so to say. So there could be like other types of services. Um, yes. So these are the implications that I've uh, sort of said is, that I've um, found from self-driving technology in general. And I will go a bit about into the research process that I've used in my papers. And I've there's three papers to start with in this uh, thesis. And two of them uses the same research process and the third one is a, a bit different. So to start with this one, this is paper A and paper B. In my research, I started with just browsing what has been done previously uh, in the research. And I made some for a, a scenario development as well to, to actually, okay, what are we actually going to investigate in this project? Okay, we're going to have a look at um, decreased uh, costs for public transport, maybe, uh, to, to that we don't need a driver anymore. Also, uh, had a look into different models, ended up with using samplers. Um, then I applied these scenarios to the model as well, made some analysis and, um, and uh, uh, wrote paper A and paper B. And so. Whereas for the other project that I've been working on with this, uh, we didn't really do the choosing models that, uh, because that's what, that was sort of predetermined. 
uh, from the project description. And there were a lot of reasons to choose Samper. So we, I didn't really do a full investigation into which model should be used because that's what's, yeah. Uh, it was pretty clear that that was the right one to use in this project. Um, and what I actually did to investigate this is that I made a lot of changes to um, to samples to evaluate these different scenarios. I made changes to the value of travel time that I've discussed previously, accident rates, road capacity, cost of vehicles as well, um, the type of and also the type of service available to citizens as well. So mainly some sort of like on demand service that that. Um, uh, that replaced uh, what we call like a normal uh, bus service with fixed line in paper A and paper B, um, but not in paper uh, C, which used sort of a normal line instead. Um, yes. Um, and in paper A and paper B, I outlined, and this is just an example from one of the scenarios, which had an on-demand public transport and a taxi service included in it as well. And what I did in this project was that I had a look at the road capacity, which was unchanged for local roads, but for highway, I doubled this due to the, yeah, that was a conclusion from the state of the art uh, to have a look at that. I changed the car access in the samples model uh, to 100% uh, car access. So basically said, told the model that everyone has access to a car. Um, yes, so, oh, I, oh, sorry, this is actually driver's license. So driver's license for accessibility and car ownership, which was both set to 100%. So everyone has access to a car instead. But then I made changes to the running cost as well. So instead of purchasing a car and having a low marginal cost to use it, so basically paying, paying for gas, I instead set a number which corresponds to the total uh, value, uh, the total value of using the service over its extended period. So we basically pay for each huge usage instead of paying a huge sum of money in the beginning. So originally this was, 0.2 instead, which is the marginal cost of usage, usage today. So in Swedish terms, this is basically that it costs about 20 kroners to, to, uh, per mil. So two kroners per kilometer to drive today. But what I instead did here is that I put it at five kroners uh, per kilometers to be able to incorporate um, uh these like that you actually want to need to pay for the vehicle as you use it instead um i had a look at bus traffic headway as well and halved this uh due to the decreased costs associated with with um, the public transport due to removing the driver and made changes to the rail traffic as well uh, due to this actually becomes a lot cheaper outside of rush hour. Um, and then replaced all public transport bus lines with a headway about 10 minutes with sort of a direct line instead, um, which is sort of like the on-demand solution in this case instead. And I did not uh, model the value of travel time in the first two papers. Um, yes, I'm not sure it tracks it services either and not empty vehicle congestion uh, uh, kilometers should be uh, in this paper due to limitations of the samples model uh, whereas in the paper c and this is just one of the scenarios that we had to look at in this project i made assumptions about vehicle accident rates uh, injury rates uh, the increased cost of vehicles purchasing uh the perceived value of time as well which i put to about 30 percent less than before um and then a lot of infrastructure costs in this project as well to have, sort of to understand how this change um and then change the headway as previously 
um, and then change the cost of operations um, as well due to the uh, personnel cost changing so much. So in this scenario, for example, I assume that we have a operator uh, connecting remotely, but be that we only need one operator for 20 vehicles. Instead of one driver per vehicle, we have one person sitting remotely controlling it in case of that we need to take over for any reason. Uh, and then the average vehicle speed in this specific scenario as well. Um, so my key findings um, in this thesis. So which potentials could we see? First of all, that, that we could have large uh, savings from removing a driver, especially for bus traffic. Uh, but at the same time, we would probably have increased costs for infrastructure, increased maintenance, more operational staff as well. Probably not in the same, um, on the same level as having a driver today, but still that we would have increased costs. Could be that we get more comfortable trips as well. Um, it is. Uh, maybe also gains in injury reductions, but I made really aggressive assumptions here and still found a really small advantage to those. So this is probably pretty small. Um, and that smaller and more flexible vehicles uh, could you be used more like on demand, so to say, in this. Um, yes. So which parameters do we actually need to change then in order to incorporate this into four-step transport models? First of all, road capacity and congestion behavior. Um, second, uh, that we could increase the public transport service levels due to the decreased costs. Um, that we need to model this first and last mile services in some way as well uh, within these um, models. Changes to the value of travel time as well. Uh, and increased availability of the car mode as well, as I talked about previously, that I basically said that everyone had access to their own car, that everyone has a driver's license as well. And what would this then apply, imply for the public transport system? Or for the transport system? That these like large cost savings due to removing the driver could be used to increase the service levels. However, I, fall re I found really small effects for this for Stockholm uh, in general. When I increased the service levels quite dramatically, it's, the effects were large, but not as large as I assumed. But I actually found really large geographical variations here. So not a big effect for downtown Stockholm, but a large effect for um, more rural areas where we have quite poor public transport service today. Um, yes, could be also potentially really large societal gains from increased comfortability as well, if these buses would drive a bit more smoother than they do today. Um, and that self-driving technology could also have large costs for infrastructure as well, depending on how this would actually be solved and what the requirements are to actually fulfill uh, this technology. Um, should also be mentioned that some travelers might need a person on board. Uh, the bus as well to help with guiding with some sort of problem solving as well uh, and just asking for directions is a pretty obvious one as well and i also found that costs and benefits really vary among different um, residents and actors as well so some might perceive this as way better than before and others might perceive it as worse than before and that for uh, public actors is really worried, for example. So infrastructure is usually covered by uh, by municipalities, for example, to actually build roads and sort of to maintain, whereas the uh, public transport operators would have large gains when they don't need a driver anymore. So large savings. So a bit about the limitations then. Um, I have not studied shared trips when it comes to taxis, um, for example, which is 
often highlighted as a major improvement, for example, and a major possibility for um, self-driving technology. Um, the value of time is really uncertain. Um, first of all, which was really one of the like state of the art. When I made an overview of the research area, I saw that this is people really have a lot of assumptions on what this means and it really affects the results quite a lot. And this is hard to model properly as well, um, especially in samples. Um, it should also be mentioned that the sample model is really complex. And it's sometimes you can make changes to it, which has unintended consequences as well. When we have these really big models, uh, everything is connected in sometimes uh, in ways that might be hard to under to understand as well. Uh, for me as a researcher, why we get specific results when changing something. And then a bit about that it could be possible to use other types of models that would be able to especially have a look at these like shared trips of path, uh, which are agent based models and microscopic and mesoscopic models could be better for modeling um, road capacity as well, much better than the Sampers model, which uses macroscopic um, flow um, models. Um, Yes, so to conclude a bit, self-driving technology would mean a really wide array of effects. There's a lot of different areas that would be affected by self-driving technology because the transport system is connected to so much, many other aspects of society. Um, we could have substantial cost savings for public transport as well. Uh, there would also be new possibilities um, we could have new types of services that are unhindered by itineraries. So this is driver at itineraries. So the schedules for drivers uh, or operational areas that we can't actually drive public transport in all areas due to, for example, the road width or that it's not able to turn somewhere or something, which you can't do with a full-sized bus. So there are possibilities of new types of services using self driving technology. And that smoother driving behavior could lead to large benefits for society as well. Uh, so having a bus that drives a bit more smoother is actually extremely large societal gain. Um, but still that a lot of tasks performed by the driver are not easily automated. Um, so asking, so basically answering questions, for example, or maintaining some sort of social order on the bus, for example and that we need to change forcep models in order to emulate this new technology, the new behavior that might occur from this technology. So that was it. Thank you.